What if entrepreneurship, and not policy, were to be given the opportunity to show the way out of the inner city welfare trap? We're about to find out. This is the Economics for Business podcast. We are here to help all businesses become champions for customers and value, improving lives with preferred and innovative products and services. We offer you the knowledge and tools to make your entrepreneurial journey a successful one. Now, here's your host, Hunter Hastings. Hi, Hunter Hastings here. We believe in entrepreneurship as the tide that can raise all the boats. Entrepreneurs create new value for consumers, resulting in profits, jobs in entrepreneurial firms, contracts for suppliers and vendors to entrepreneurial firms, who then go on to create new jobs themselves in turn, new trading opportunities for every part of the value chain from brick and mortar retail stores to online retail platforms to manufacturing to global import export brokers. It's well known that entrepreneurial growth businesses are the greatest job creators. The jobs entrepreneurs create are not just employment contracts. For those who fulfill those jobs, who work in those jobs, they're a foundation a source of stability and positive future expectations. Jobs bind families together. They give kids a stable and thriving home life. They give neighborhoods economic and social cohesion and vibrancy. What if entrepreneurs could elevate entire cities? What if untrammeled entrepreneurship was given reign to be the solution for all the troubles that tend to accompany city formation, and especially what we now call the inner city, the transitional unemployment? the low academic achievement of city kids, the criminality of the excluded, the phobias and pathologies of those who feel unsafe, those who don't have security. When we advance the message and the narrative of entrepreneurship, it's for all. It's to solve everyone's problems, to give everyone the hope that comes with opportunity, to share the knowledge with all. Therefore, it's a delight to encounter an economic activist who feels the same way. Dale Caldwell is a professor and executive director of the Rothman Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Fairleigh Dickinson University. He is a management consultant and executive coach. He's held senior executive roles in the public, private, and civic nonprofit sectors. He's created his own trademarked intelligent influence framework on leadership development and wrote a book with that title. You can listen to him on the subject on YouTube. Today, we're going to talk to Dale about all of this, but especially about one of his most significant inventions, Entrepreneur Zones, an initiative that can deliver that elevation of achievement and experience to families in inner cities that need an entrepreneurial boost. Dale, welcome to the Economics for Business podcast. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, this is going to be an exciting episode. You are an entrepreneur extraordinaire, as I call you. There's no end to your creativity in identifying and launching and and growing new business initiatives. And we'll talk about some of your initiatives today, but we're going to concentrate on one very special one. Uh, You have a name for it, Entrepreneur Zones, and we'll explain that as we we go through. Uh, We have an exciting announcement to make, or you have, and um, let me precede it, and then you can explain in more detail. As a result of all of your creative thinking and leadership and, and uh, a little bit of lobbying, I suspect, <laughs> the New Jersey legislature has passed into law the New Jersey Economic Recovery Act of 2020, which includes a working group um, that you'll be involved with. I'm not sure whether you'll head it or orchestrate it, um, whereby you will establish entrepreneur zones. Uh, you have thoughts about the state providing tax incentives, regulation relief, and financial support, but you'll also involve a lot of other uh, entities and institutions as well um, to help local entrepreneurs as the most effective way to create jobs in the state. So there's a lot there to unpack. We'll, we'll do that in our conversation. So let's start with introductions, uh, Dale. Tell us how you got started, your origin story, and and how you got to where you are today. Well, again, Hunter, I just thank you so much for having me on your show. You know, I I just think so highly of you and 
I, I love your, the way you think and uh, and process things. So it's it's a it's an honor to to be here, but also to work with you on this project. And so um, I always start with uh, my mom was a school teacher for fifty years. My dad, who recently passed away in September, knew in March with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so I grew up around the civil rights movement. My dad was in Selma and the March on Washington and and the Poor People's Campaign, and, and that had an influence on me. Um, my mom valued education. I had a, a chance to go to, I went to Princeton undergrad. I got a degree in economics and I got an MBA in finance from Wharton and then later a doctorate from uh, Seton Hall University. Um, but but I, I really wanted to connect business to community growth and community development. And uh, um, I've been at the Roth of the Fairleigh Dickinson University, Rothman Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship for the last two and a half years. It's in the Silverman College of Business. And so really have become a voice for entrepreneurship in New Jersey and really across the, the country. And so, um, so when I can talk more about this idea of entrepreneur zones as a way to marry entrepreneurship and business and community revitalization. Yeah, and just as an aside, Dale, you mentioned to me once, which I didn't know, and I looked up and, and uh, found out more about it, that the... The uh, March on Washington with Martin Luther King was called the March for Freedom and Jobs, I think, or it had jobs in its goal, right? Yeah, well, it was actually the jobs and jobs and freedom. So jobs came before freedom. And, and Dr. King knew that it was really all about jobs, all about economic prosperity for, for individuals. Yep. Well, thanks for reminding us of that. And so let's start with your Entrepreneur's Zone initiatives. In economics, we always say entrepreneurs solve problems. You start with a problem to solve. Uh, you've analyzed it in a particularly creative way, I think, to, to get to your solution. Um, so let's highlight the problem. Tell us in more depth how you describe the problem you're trying to solve. And, and actually, let me, one thing I didn't talk about in my background and, and, and why this is so important to me is that I, uh, I always wanted to have a senior role in the public, the private, and the nonprofit slash civic sector, um, and to really understand how things work. And so I was the executive director of something called the Newark Alliance, a large nonprofit, um, then deputy commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs, and I was a, a senior manager at Deloitte Consulting for 11 years. And that gave me some insight into why things are working and not working in local communities. As you know, and we've talked about, poverty has been pervasive in America in spite of being the richest country in the history of the world. And you start to really break down what's going on in the communities and you realize that so many political leaders don't understand that money and government is not the answer, that you really have to empower local communities to really be self-sustaining. And if you do that, in my dissertation, we did research around education and that the the, the economic health of a, of a household is really more important to student academic performance than virtually anything else. So this idea of creating entrepreneur zones where you're supporting entrepreneurs to develop their businesses and hire locally has a wide ranging opportunity to transform communities. And a lot of people haven't thought of it that way. Yeah, and that's, that's quite advanced systems thinking. Dale, I don't know whether you refer to it yourself that way, but you're thinking about the whole system, the, the educations, the family, the community, the jobs, the entrepreneurs, the businesses. It's a systems approach to solving the problem. Well, and, and, and you really, and I've learned that from you. And, and again, obviously, in, I majored in economics at Princeton. We, I, I knew a little about system thinking, but the, the more traditional types of economics as opposed to Austrian economics really, you know, aren't as relevant to, to, to what we're talking about now. And I just love this Austrian economics focusing on entrepreneurship and focusing on systems, because we, we, if we're serious about the problem, we have to approach it in a systems way, systems thinking way. Yeah. I would add one point about Austrian economics, uh, Dale. It's, it's about people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the economics that they taught you and me in school was about aggregates like GDP and, right. and uh, right. the economy and so on. And, and we like to think about, about people. And it's also about cause and effect. And one of the things I, I learned from you in your analytics, you've identified a, a very compelling causal factor that you have uh, ascertained is, is part of the problem or it's, it's a cause of the problem. Can you speak to that a little bit about the, the special problems in urban areas? 
Well, you know, one of the one of the challenges, and I spent most of my life. I live in an urban community now, so I, I lived in in Roxbury section of Boston, in Harlem, in New York, and um, in in uh, went to in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm, I'm in, in in New Brunswick, New Jersey now. And you start to really look at what's going on in those communities, and and you know, one of the realities is, and I actually ran a charter school in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, and saw that many of the students had what looked like post traumatic stress disorder that uh, many of the same symptoms that people would coming from war would have and the inability to focus and, and a lot of distractions. And I coined a term called urban traumatic stress disorder because many of the folks in those communities are dealing with intensive stress, but also are dealing with, uh, are, are dealing with, with issues around trauma. And things like mindfulness are very helpful. And so when you begin to look at that and you start to understand the role that that plays in student academic performance, job performance, and community interaction. You know, in the United States, around the world, we're dealing with issues with police and the community. And what's happening is that trauma that both are facing provides some conflict. And so if we're going to have a systems approach to really turning these communities around, we have to take the, that into account. Just go into a little bit more depth of, of some of the stresses and the traumas that you've observed and, and how it affects behavior and outcomes and, and potential for individuals. Well, and, and, and when you start to look at it, I mean, there have been other studies, but mostly suburban studies. I mean, poverty in and of itself is when you don't know where your next, you know, whether you'll be able to, to pay for food on your table or, or, or a roof over your head, there's some real trauma there. And that trauma often leads to abuse, to just being frustrated and, and hitting your child or, or, or doing even worse things. Then you deal with the issues of crime in the community because there's a lack of jobs and, and people are stealing. Well, one of the things I created and, and use this in my dissertation called the Living Wage Index. And we take the MIT Living Wage Calculator, which tells you what the households of different size need to make and, and use that to assess what percentage of households in urban communities can actually pay their bills, Hunter. And what we found in urban communities in America, and I suspect around the world, that more than 50% of the households don't make enough to pay their bills. So the only way that they can survive is if they steal, is if they break the law, and hence they interact with the police. And so when you're looking at this trauma that comes from that, you have to say, well, how do we deal with that? Well, one way to do that is to create businesses in the community. IBM or Google is not going to go into the community and hire people who've never been working. And so we need to really, from the people up approach, as you know, I use the, I coined the term people up as opposed to bottom up, to really start to develop solutions. And that's what the entrepreneur zones are really all about. Well, you've, you've done an exemplary job, uh, Dale, of walking us through what's the problem to solve. And you've done cause and effect analysis, which we, uh, we love to understand. And you've got some unique analytics. So, you're really impressive in your approach. Let's talk about your uh, design approach, how you're designing the solution. How did you uh, get to this idea or what were the steps towards the idea of entrepreneur zones? Well, it, it, it really, you know, I, I had been at the Rothman Institute uh, for about a year. And in New Jersey, there was this major battle about tax credits. And so the previous governor had given a billion dollars of tax credits um, to uh, businesses associated with one very influential individual. And so the current governor said, you know, and, and the tax credits they were giving to these companies were supposedly to keep them from leaving. So they would give these incredible tax benefits and financial benefits to these companies. And it turns out they weren't going to leave anyway, but they took the, those benefits. And so uh, the current governor said, well, that's ridiculous. We're going to get rid of all, well, he happens to be, you know, a Goldman Sachs person, you know, but doesn't quite understand kind of local small business, and they were going to get rid of the tax credits. And so I said, and I wrote an article and talked to some of my political contacts and said, whoa, 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 let's, well, let's not get rid of, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, let's keep those tax credits, but why not use them to incentivize investment in these communities that are struggling and investment in entrepreneurial businesses that can actually help to turn around the community? And I was been overwhelmed by the response to that article saying, um, you know, uh, entrepreneur zones, you know, we don't need opportunity zones as much as we need entrepreneur zones. And, and the head of the Economic Development Authority, Tim Sullivan, really understood that idea 
and uh, actually put it in the original legislation, but that didn't pass because of this battle between two people of the same party about whether you keep tax credits or you get rid of them. So, um, and uh, so as we, as you you mentioned, this was recently passed, and so people are starting to we're creating a movement to really start to believe that hey, well maybe this might make some sense. So that's why we have that 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 working group, and and that's that's really how this idea came about. And uh, I've just, it's amazing how many people have really started to, to say this makes sense. A quick note. Did you know that we provide supplemental materials for each podcast? Listening to and understanding the key takeaways from our expert guests helps you think better about building a more beautiful business. Taking direct action and implementing these strategies is when the real work begins. Take a concrete, immediate step to implementing a better business model today by downloading the show notes and business tool we've created for this episode. Visit Mises.org slash E4BPod. That's M-I-S-E-S dot org slash E, the number four, the letter B, P-O-D. And click on today's episode. Now, back to our interview. Well, that's wonderful, and the the idea obviously will will evolve and grow and become more and more solid as your working group addresses it. But let's let's see if we can have you describe what you think some of the features of the entrepreneur zones will will be. What will you include include besides the the tax credits and so on that you've mentioned? What are the features of an entrepreneur zone? Well, well there there are a couple of things. So one, obviously, we talked about the tax credits to incentivize investors to put money into businesses. We also have to train the entrepreneurs that many of the entrepreneurs in these communities didn't grow up, you know, three or four generations of entrepreneurs in their families. So they need some some real guidance on how to become the best entrepreneurs they can be. Um, But we also want to have training um, around those folks that that don't really fully understand entrepreneurship to really kind of get the next generation of entrepreneurs coming up. But in addition, we want to do job training. So, uh, you know, if, if one of the biggest challenges of entrepreneurs, of family and small businesses is finding the best employees. And so we are aligned with some programs that can work to help to train employees, people who may not be entrepreneurial in their mindset, what could be fantastic workers if given what I call trauma-informed job training. And trauma-informed because many people are dealing with this urban traumatic stress disorder. Um, so those are some of the components were around you know, entrepreneurship, the various levels of entrepreneurship, job training. But Hunter, one of the things that I think is really important is that we can incentivize an alignment of some of the other government programs, housing programs, education programs, healthcare programs. And and so so by aligning them with the entrepreneur the, the entrepreneurial businesses, we can begin to create some synergy and and a more effective investment of tax dollars into really turning around the community. So we look at it as as the entrepreneurs are really just the the the, the tail wagging the, the dog for a whole community revitalization. Yeah, you use the you use the term tail wagging the dog. I like that, but the the. Uh... The economic way of saying that is the entrepreneurs drive the market system. Yep. And yep. that's what you've recognized, I think, the entrepreneur's driver. Uh, I heard you also call your vision a value creation network, which mm-hmm. I also like a lot because it focuses on value. And the way we define entrepreneurship, it's, it's the pursuit of new economic value. But let's, let's look at the word network. Mm-hmm. You've got government in the network, but what about some other elements of the network? You've got you've got banks, you've got educational institutions. Who else do you think is in the network? Well, well certainly the community-based nonprofits are part of the, the network, and so it's it's critical for those nonprofits to uh, to play a role. And so they may do some of the job training uh, for the for the employees uh, for the for the employees. One of the keys too is really job coaching. And so, um, you know, where there have been billions of dollars spent around the world on job training programs, but that's what they do. They train people for jobs. Many of them don't exist or they get in the job and they don't last in the job because they don't have continuous coaching. It's very hard to go from that. And so those nonprofits play a critical role. Um, The religious institutions in the community 
play a critical role, that they often are, are among the most economically sound uh, institutions there, and they can provide support. And, and, and it's really this value creation network. And when I say it's a network, um, one of the things is, you know, I wrote this book called Intelligent Influence, and it's all about influence, is that all that really exists is influence. And so one of the things, Hunter, that we're trying to, to do with this concept is to influence people to believe to believe that this there is this value creation network. And if if people believe that, then all of a sudden it will happen. One of the things that, you know, I don't remember a lot from my Wharton MBA, um, but I do remember the fact that if 3% of the, of the banks in the United States went out of business, the whole system would collapse. And the reality is that it's all built on the faith and credit and trusting. And so if we can create trust in the community around this concept, then all of a sudden good things will happen. Yep. I certainly subscribe to that. I, I also, when you say value creation network, I think of um, how to build a supply chain. So an entrepreneur has to learn how to be a good customer to attract the right suppliers and keep them. And then at the other end, how to fit into a, a bigger system, how to be a vendor or a supplier to General Motors or Chase or, or one of the other large companies that might, uh, that might buy what the entrepreneur is selling because the realist approach to small business is it serves big business in many cases. So have you, have you thought about that network of both suppliers and, and being a supplier? Yes. And, 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 and one of the things that, um, so I've written in, and, and I, I like to, to kind of make some of my thoughts public. So I've written about eight different articles this year around this. And so one of the things I talk about is, uh, um, I call it diversity spend reporting. And I'm saying we don't have to mandate anything, but public agency oh, in New Jersey, there's uh, you, you have to apply to be certified as a veteran owned business, business certified as a, a women owned business certified as a minority owned business. And so what I say is that, um, you know, we don't have to mandate that people use these businesses, but report on your website. Every public agency should report on their website. And a lot of corporations are starting to track this. How much are you spending with these businesses? And just by reporting that, that all of a sudden, because right now they're not spending much at all, maybe not, not even 1%, most of the major agencies, and you need to look at school districts. In Newark alone, the Newark public school system has a billion dollar budget. And right now, with all of the service, you could be a restaurant, you could be a cleaning house, you could have all sorts of small businesses if they were certain, if you, if you looked at how much how much they spent with certified businesses that could generate tens of millions of dollars for local businesses. But right now they just go to big, you know, they go to big organizations, you know, who don't necessarily even need that extra revenue. Um, and that could be a game changer. Yeah. yeah that's a great point. And the, you, you talked about attracting investment. The entrepreneurs need capital, obviously, and there's, there's plenty of economic theory around that, but we need practice. We need to, help them get investment. In my mind, there could be a couple of ways you could do that. You could set up almost like a venture capital fund to invest in individual businesses, or you could set up a platform to invest in the entrepreneur zone in, in total. Have you, have you done any thinking about attracting investment? Yeah, I, I, I like the latter um, most. When I first came out this and I did a white paper, a number of people from other university institutions dealing with entrepreneurs what was really saying that the universities could really manage a fund, if you will. And that's kind of how the opportunity zones, um, you know, work and, and a fund for the area, because th there, there are multiple levels to this. One level is managing the money. So say we raise, you know, $20 million for one particular entrepreneur zone. Um, you have a money manager who can manage that money. Then you have a, 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 like a university with some expertise to really evaluate the businesses to see how that money can be best used to really help the businesses grow, help them hire people and begin turning around that community. You really need both because most money, man, you know, most, most investment people are great at investments, but they don't understand entrepreneurial development or community development. So then you have, so that university uh, money manager partnership um, can be very, very, very powerful and really making sure the money is spent well, it's tracked, and, and there are actually evaluation um, systems in place. And research, and research. 
Yeah, there's another model that uh, we might look at, Dale. Mm -hmm. uh, it came from Israel. as a platform called Our Crowd. And uh, the Israeli uh, tech world was producing a lot of innovations, but they were finding it difficult to get investment on the global stage from outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. And they set up this platform that allows investors to uh, examine businesses, to choose which ones they can invest in. They can invest in themes like healthcare or other kinds of themes. Um, but the due diligence is done for them on the platform so they can trust it. And they just have to decide how much and where to put their investments and they can manage a portfolio that way. So there are a number of ways to do what you're, what you're talking about. And we might investigate that. Yeah, I, I like that. I, I like that. I, I think, you know, early on, you know, a lot of the businesses need to kind of, we need to work with them to get to that stage where they become attractive investments. But I love that our, our, our crowd approach. I think that's great. Right. Good. And then uh, monitoring and support. It's, uh, it's a little early to, to think about this, but how will you monitor the progress of entrepreneur zones? What would you like to see as some of the indicators of, hey, we're making good progress here? Well, you know, one of the, and, and, and yeah, as you've gotten to know me, you know, by now, I, I like measures of success, you know, and I, you know, it seems like every week I come up with new measures. I, I bombard you with new measures like I did this morning with some new ideas. Well, how do we measure this? And, and I just value the way you think and approach things. Um, but, you know, one measure is, um, is really looking at the net revenue increase of the businesses that we work with you know, to really kind of track that. So we're in an entrepreneur zone. We've uh, made some investments. We've helped to, to guide the entrepreneur. You know, let's see what, what is the result and really kind of measure that. So to really look at, you know, how, are we making a real difference? Um, another is to really look at employment. You know, how in our target organizations, our target area, are more people being employed? Are they being employed at higher, at higher rates? Um, it will take a little longer, but we want to understand, as I mentioned, the living wage index. What is the, um, um, you know, what is the household income? What is the impact of this on the household income? And so, you know, probably would take a year to really study that. What is the impact on student academic achievement related to this? As, uh, as, as I, I mentioned to you, I'm actually on four school boards. I'm actually president of two and VP and vice president of two. Um, two are charter, one's traditional public, and one's a special needs district. So you know, very active in education. And if parent, I would rather every, uh, every one of my parents had a job that helped them pay their household bills, that would have more impact on student academic achievement than all of the programs that are out there with, when parents can't afford to pay their bills because they can't actively support their students. So this is something that I, I, I am sure is going to have a significant impact on student academic achievement over time, but it will take time to do that. Yeah. I think also you and I might look for measures of uh, community, right. community health. I mean, maybe that's not the right word, a sentiment. How do they feel? Are people okay. in the community feeling like things are vibrant, there's opportunity, I like living here, I'm really excited about what's going on? some kind of qualitative measures of those kinds of community uh, sense. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we were talking earlier about the, what I call, I'm calling the people up poll. Mm -hmm. Really every mayor should be doing this, should really actually survey your community. What's going on? What are the needs? How do people feel about what's going on? You know, and, and whenever you have a horrible thing like the pandemic that we're, we're, we're still going through, and, and you come out of it, there are new opportunities to do things very differently. And our emotional well-being has really been shaken because of, because of the crisis. So, so I would think that it would make sense if I was a mayor of a town to really, as this you know, vaccine is spread and so on, to come out and do a people up poll. What's going on? What's the sentiment of our community? How are we feeling? Where do we want to go? One of the articles that I wrote was... Uh, about these zones, I, I had a little graph that um, talked about, are you in the panic zone? Are you in the awareness zone? Or are you in the success zone? And, and really asking questions, are you constantly negative and so on? Are you in the panic zone? Are you aware of your, your emotions and trying to manage them? Or are you feeling great and helping other people? 
And it's amazing, Hunter, how many people have told me, well, I have that on my fridge because I, I'm encouraging people to do a daily check-in. How are you feeling in the midst of this crazy COVID craziness? And so I think doing these kinds of polls really can be very helpful in gauging the, the emotional well-being of a community. Yeah, I love that idea, emotional well-being. And our mayors that you just said should be running the people up polls, they should be publishing those zonal charts too. So yeah, yeah. That, that'd be a measure of their success. And talking about civics and mayors and, and so on, you, you also have an idea that the, let's call it tax productivity mm-hmm. of a community or a town or a, a urban area might be greater if we have more small businesses and more entrepreneurs employing more people than it would be with the Walmarts and the, and the uh, Home Depots coming in, even though a lot of local politicians encourage that. What's your thinking about that, that uh, tax productivity? Well, that's a great, that's a great question. You know, um, having been involved, so the Department of Community Affairs oversees all of the, the mayors and the local, the finances and local municipalities. So I have a sense of, of the thinking of, of local mayors who are great people by and large. Um, but it sounds so much sexier if you're up for re-election to say, we're going to bring in a Walmart and we're going to create hundreds of jobs with the Walmart. And uh, we're going to give them tax, tax breaks so that they can come into our town. And it sounds great and it sounds like you are, you're making progress, but there's never really an analysis of what's the impact of that. And in some ways, in some communities, it's like dropping an atom, you know, a business atomic bomb that in my area, uh, I think, and certainly Piscataway, because of the Home Depot, that every one of in that area, every one of the five family owned hardware stores have all closed. And these folks were employing people at, at really living wages. They had great benefits. And if you know anything about family businesses in the audience, family businesses are probably the best place for people to work, better than nonprofits, government, big corporations, because once you're part of the family, you know, you don't have to be blood relative. They treat you incredibly well. Whereas we know the turnover in these big box stores is, is really tremendous. What the benefits are and what they pay per hour doesn't compare to the local businesses. So, so we need to create some index, some indice to, to really identify how, what is the cost to the community of bringing in a big box store. Um, not, to, not the political perception, but what is the actual long term cost to the community? And, and, and there aren't really any measures to do that because politicians aren't going to ask for that because they don't want to see that they gave away the store to bring in this business and close businesses and hurt the community. They don't want people to know that. Yep. Yeah, and there's, there's another qualitative component to that that you've, you've uh, highlighted there, which is the quality of employment, not the, the yeah. numerics of it, but the quality of it. Do I like my job? Do I love working there? Do I feel like I'm working for somebody who values me and that's that's very important too. Yeah, and the safety of the job, the safety of job. You know, is yep. this is this something I can be? Because you look at you know most family businesses, there are people there who aren't necessarily even paid as well as some other places, but will stay there for forty years because the quality of life that it gives them is far superior to to a job and paying a lot more money that's not secure. And. So one of the implications of all of this that you, we've talked about today, Dale, is that small business is not respected as much as it, it should be. It's not loved as much. You said in one of your papers that, that entrepreneurship itself is undervalued or it's not valued in the right way. Why is that? You've, you've, you've been delving through this, this system for a long time. Why is small business not, not respected and loved the way it should be? And this is where my background at working in, uh, in you know, in an influential nonprofit, a, an influential government agency, and an influential business uh, has paid off because um, it's it's actually very clear to me that as a public official, you are so overwhelmed with the problems of the of the state or the community that you basically listen to whoever yells the loudest. And the trouble is that small business people, family business people, or local business people, and, and it is, is they're working to pay the bills. They aren't politicians. They're not lobbyists. They often don't know their, their legislature or Congress, certainly. And so the politicians don't hear from them. 
And Hunter, the, the, the pandemic that we're dealing with in, in, in the world is, is it's so clear how the politicians knew nothing about, about um, entrepreneurial businesses, about local businesses, because what they, they, they didn't realize how many people are employed. So the unemployment has hit record levels, uh, even with the stock market hitting record levels. So big companies are actually doing okay on the whole. But the small business, so that's where the unemployment is. And they're starting to realize that these businesses are the backbone of America. They're the backbone of every country in the world. And so, um, and so my hope is to use this momentum to kind of wake them up to, to really say, help them understand that this is really the most important thing you can do is create jobs and support the businesses that create jobs. And so we're, because we're a, a university, we've become a voice for and a lobbyist for people who just don't have time to lobby for themselves. Well, it'll be a brilliant achievement if you can uh, get them to wake up to understand how intricately small and family and entrepreneurial businesses are woven into the health of the community, how it all works together in ways that they don't understand. So we look forward to that. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question about economics they didn't tell you in school, <laughs> <laughs> Dale. There's, there's a concept of, of uh, spontaneous order, self-organizing systems. You know, once you get them started and you get the right components in them, they can manage themselves. They'll grow naturally. They'll, they'll, they'll uh, thrive without a lot of uh, regulation or, or control or management or central planning. Is, is that your vision for the entrepreneur zones? Yeah, and it really has to be the vision that we don't. I I really say it's not about money in the long run; it's about mindset, and 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 really, it's you know like most most things that are sustainable are really built on a basic concept, and and the basic concept is that and, and obviously my most of my background has been in consulting. So you look at a poor urban community, Hunter, and you say, okay, how are we going to turn around that community in a sustainable way? Well, most politicians have, have said, well, government funding is going to turn it around. And, and, and there's no way in the world that government funding can be sustainable. Even if even in the richest country in the history of the world, it's not sustainable. And that's, that's the approach they've been taking. Instead, I'm saying, you know, businesses need to just help them grow, help them be successful, and they will become self-sustaining without government support down the road. And, and, and that's the way. And it's, it's amazing that people hadn't thought of it that way. They haven't realized that, you know, the war on poverty was well-intentioned by, you know, President Johnson and others. But um, the analogy I use is, you know, we were giving people a fish instead of teaching them to create fishing businesses. Mm -hmm. so what we're trying to do is say, let's teach people to create fishing businesses so that they can become self-sustainable. They have greater confidence with themselves. That government can support them when they're crises like we're dealing with now. But on the whole, in a normal economy, they'll be sustainable. And the best thing about this, Hunter, is that the, the U.S. economy will improve. If we have entrepreneur zones in every, every poor, economically challenged section of the country, all of a sudden the gross national product will skyrocket because it's, it's about people up. And it's not about the stock. It's not about the Dow Jones. Um, that's not going to be the bellwether of the economy. This, this growth of small businesses will, will be a much better measure of, of how we're doing as a society. Yeah, that's a great vision. And if you can communicate that and, and convince all the people you need to convince, that'll, that'll be a great achievement. So I, I'll, I'll end with a, a question about imagination. We always say that the great tool of entrepreneurs is, is their own imagination, which is unlimited and they can bring it about. So if I walk into Newark or one of the towns where you're going to uh, establish these entrepreneur zones and I look around five years from now or seven years from now and I talk to people, describe what I'll see and what I'll hear and, and how I'll be surprised. And, and, and one of the things that I've been, been involved with, as I've, I've mentioned to you, is uh, you know, next year is the 100th anniversary of the horrible race massacre of the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, which when many of the listeners may not even know about this, um, um, which was called Black Wall Street. It was in 1921. 
And uh, because of segregation, Plessy versus Ferguson made segregation the law of the land here. So black businesses were forced to be in a particular area, be segregated. And, you know, the black community supported them. So this this town section in Tulsa, Oklahoma, became the wealthiest black community in the United States. In fact, it was so wealthy, they called it Black Wall Street. Well, unfortunately, there were some racist and white supremacists who, who bombed the place and destroyed it. But, but Black Wall Street is the vision that I have because this community, in the midst of segregation, seven of the families that lived there, Hunter, had planes. Black people in segregation had their own planes. So the community was self-sufficient. It didn't need government, you know, government support. You know, the schools were good. You know, people lived a quality life. And so that's the vision for these entrepreneur zones is that when these economically challenged communities are given the support to really to really become successful, they can become self-sustaining in a way that deals with every aspect of life, that deals with economics, that deals with healthcare, that deals with education, that deals with housing, it deals with the environment. And so, you know, I'm a big believer in, and, you know, many people are, you know, are, are, are really talking about environmental challenges as, as the, the worst challenge in the world, and, and, and they are incredibly significant challenges. What I remind folks is that 50% of the world can't pay their bills on time. So they don't have the privilege of worrying about uh, climate change and other things. And so if we want to get global support for climate change, what we need to do is deal with the global pandemic of poverty. And the way to do that is not with you know, not with welfare payments, but it's really with entrepreneur zones so that we can begin to empower communities to stand alone and people feel good about themselves and people have jobs that help them pay their bills. And I'll introduce one last word. It's your word. You, you have mentioned it before, but it's, um, it's very powerful. And you talked about an entrepreneurial movement. So you're the designer, you're, you're starting this machine working, but eventually it will be people up. It'll be a, a movement that is driven by the people and, and uh, they don't need our help to, to continue it. It'll move in, in all directions on its own. So I love that part of the vision. And, and that's and, and, and that's that's it, because it really isn't about money. It's about mindset. And if people believe in this movement and, 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 and Hunter, one of the reasons that I'm so excited about this concept is, you know, we went through a very divisive election where more than 74 million people voted for two different candidates. And I've talked to entrepreneur zones for to, to people who are staunch supporters of 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 both candidates. Totally at odds in every other policy way. But they believe in this idea of entrepreneur zones, of really helping communities use entrepreneurship to get back on their feet, both the most liberal people I know and the most conservative people I know. So, so I think there's hope that this could be the kind of thing that brings the world together around a common, a common issue, a common item, and a common well-being. And once we get these things going and there's some momentum and there's some measurement and there's some research, I think there will be a movement. Uh, because it'd be very hard to be against that kind of movement. Yeah, people who listen to this podcast know that we think in terms of 100% economics and 0% politics. Yep. That's our ideal. Yep. And, so. yep. and that, that's really what I want. I, I just want, you know, I, this is, just get away from your politics and really focus on what makes sense. And, and the beauty is for those that are really embedded in politics, it seems to make sense to people who are at odds. So I think we can focus on this and, and have it be a nonpartisan, non-political approach to really you know, to really dealing with you know my this this thing called systemic poverty well that's wonderful and uh dale it's been a real privilege getting to know you and and to learn about what you're doing you're an inspiring individual and your your imagination knows no bounds but also you you find ways to put it into practice that nobody else has ever done before so I, I love what you're doing. Congratulations on on getting to this point and all you've achieved. And and uh, please call upon me personally and our organizations to help in any way we can because we we absolutely support your ideas. Well, well Hunter, I feel the same way. I, I really it's been such a a real blessing to get to know you and and I've learned so much from you already. And you're part of this journey. This is not 
you know, this isn't about Dale Caldwell. This is really about creating something that has legs, that can be self-sustaining, as you said, that, that will start to empower people. And, 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 and you know, and I know uh, we're near the end of time, but, you know, growing up in urban communities and I went to private schools. And so I have a pretty good sense of the community, um, of what the community in black and Latino and white poor communities. Um, and that's why I feel very confident that this would work, because I know the community. I know the people. I was there myself. And I think that the approach that the world has been taking, you know, has not involved entrepreneurship. Um, in the way that it needs to, because it is the fuel that really allows things to to to, to really grow. And um, um, but you know, it's it's a lot of people don't come from this background and they don't fully understand that um, how powerful it is. One of the things that I say is is if every politician in the world had to have made payroll this world would be a very different place. If they knew how difficult it was to make payroll, you would see all sorts of support for entrepreneurs. Well, let's work together to uh, get them to see and understand that and to get a lot of people to join in the movement. We're, we're uh, ready for the journey. Well, Hunter, thank you so very much. And uh, thanks for your support and being part of this, this entrepreneurial movement. Well, thank you. I look forward to continuing to be a part of it. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Dale. Economics for Business is a production of the Mises Institute. To explore more content like this, visit Mises.org. And for more from Hunter Hastings, visit HunterHastings.com.